Hello, and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This is a show about Haskell, a purely functional programming language. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I'm the Director of Software Engineering at ACI Learning. And I'm here today, Cameron Guerra, um, a Senior Software Engineer at Moto Refact. So, uh, different uh, title, um, as the, the consistent listeners may know, um, I am a new member of the Moto Refi team and uh, still very passionate about Haskell and, and actually using Haskell at Moto Refi. Um, still very committed to the podcast and being um, able to just bring this to the community. I think it's been a great resource for me to learn. Um, I'm sure I've said wrong things and that's good because I've learned from those bad things. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, this is a awesome now, I'm glad we're getting back to this. We had an interview last week and then we were off for a week. So I'm glad to kind of hopefully continue this and get back into a rhythm. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I uh, guess enough about me. I guess we'll, we'll jump right into today's topic. Uh, it is from issue 283, um, I believe. If I'm wrong, I'm sorry, Taylor. That sounds uh, right to me. Cool. Yeah, I've only gone to the, the website a few times this week to check out the issues. Um, but we're going to be talking about a, a post by Drew Olson, who is the uh, lead ar chief architect at GoFundMe. Um, and he created a blog post just about uh, uh, looping in Haskell, and he called it very originally Adventures in Looping. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about that today, I guess. Not forever, we promise. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> Anyways, Taylor, take, take it away. What, what, what's this all about? We'll try not to get stuck in an infinite loop while we're talking about this blog post. Um, yeah, so this is an interesting one because in most programming languages, looping is built into the language. You have a while loop or a for loop or a do while or go to even. Um, but in Haskell, we don't have something like that built in. So you have to do it yourself. And the particular problem that this blog post is approaching is what happens when you're in a loop and you want to break out of it, but only sometimes. So in a normal procedural language inside of, let's say, a while loop, you might use break to say, just get me out of this entire loop and we'll continue on with whatever goes after it. Um, that turns out to be, I'm not going to call it hard, but there's no built-in support for that in Haskell. So you have to choose how do you want to do that? And that's exactly what this post uh, looks at. So the first step of it is just how do you loop at all? And anybody that's written Haskell knows that you're going to do either manual recursion, where you have a function that calls itself when it's done, and then you start over at the top, or you use something that does that for you. And the typical example is from control.monad, and it is the forever function, where you pass it an action, and it will do that action and then do it again and then do it again and keep doing it forever <laughs> you got wow. it forever and ever hmm. it's a good function name i guess it uh, makes a lot of sense yeah um so that's what he starts with um but he pretty quickly runs into a problem with that right cam where he says right. forever but he doesn't really mean forever he actually wants to get out of there well he meant forever in the beginning and then he realized <laughs> that connections aren't forever. Um, and so there he was running into some issues and got some unexpected um, return messages while he was trying to create a Slack bot um, in Haskell. So, you know, he had great intentions and he was doing everything he could. And then he was like, oh, wait, I, my connection to Slack can get disconnected. And Slack's going to actually tell me about that. Um, and we'll get a disconnect message. And so he was getting run, you know, exceptions thrown um, because it wasn't a valid message type, wasn't listening for it, was not exhaustive. Um, well, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what he did with that. He didn't really talk about it. Uh, but, you know, anyways, he, you know, needed to find a way to re make the connection fresh again um, without uh, just like, I don't know, doing a, another set of looping, whether it be recursion or forever. Um, mm -hmm. So he kind of had to, to 
had to rethink that a little bit. Um, you know, and I don't think there's, I think there's a couple ways he could have done this, uh, as far as like, how does he you know, fix this? Does he go to a manual recursion process? Um, does he choose to, uh, I mean, I'm, I feel like manual recursion is probably like the quickest one for somebody to reach to of like, okay, yeah. if I get the disconnect, let me throw, you know, do nothing and make the, my whatever forever loop I'm in restart. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's so, actually what he reaches for first, right? He breaks mm -hmm. this inner loop because as you mentioned, he now has two loops. He has the outer one that sets up this connection and then the inner one that handles messages that come on that connection. And occasionally you get a message that will tell you to disconnect. So you break out of that loop and go around your outer loop again and start collecting or start a new connection and start collecting messages on it. So mm -hmm. what he did was for that inner loop, he broke that out into a separate function where most of the cases end up calling that same function again to loop. But one of the cases, the one that tells you to disconnect, does nothing instead. So that is effectively breaking the loop and then the outer loop can continue. So like you said, I think that's a pretty um, unsurprising approach to this. So it's natural that that seems to be the first thing that he reached for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And while it's clear what's happening there's some repetitive code there right because you're calling anything with recursion you're, it's going to call itself and the fact that his type he was using had two successful cases and one failure case it was you know having you could loop from two different uh, places which isn't bad but you know there's got to be a better way uh, and so, you know, he also takes some time to to talk about the forever function. Um, it actually is can work with anything that is applicative, and the really what happens is it says, "Okay, hey, I'm not gonna care about what happens on the right side, or well, left, left side. side, I guess. The first thing, and I'm gonna yeah, the first thing, and I'm gonna execute the second thing, and that that's how it like." recursus all the time um so it really just calls itself <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and actually uh, he points out that this is and you said it can work on any applicative it doesn't actually require a monad and that is telling because with applicatives you can't make a choice based on what the previous result was that's not a power that the applicative type class gives you so the type signature tells you that it can't depend on the result of the first thing. Whereas if it was a monad, it could depend on that because that's the thing that monad adds on top of applicative. Anyway, I just thought that was worth mm -hmm. noting. No, I think that's great, yeah. And um, yeah, so he, he kind of talks more about the forever function and, and what that means and uh, you know, just kind of laying the groundwork for and explaining what the forever function uses. Um, but with this function, it, it has with the applicative star, um, star greater than, than sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that function or that operator um, will short circuit if something uh, fails. And so, you know, think about this working with applicatives and you know also the maybe monad like that. You can kind of play around with that and see what happens. Where you can say, okay, hey, I got. Um, you know, I have a nothing value and a just value, you know, and then followed by a just value. Well, it's going to short circuit and say, oh, you got, you gave me a nothing in this first case. We're done here. I can't, uh, I won't evaluate anything else. Right. It and doesn't so, matter what's on the right. As soon as you hit a nothing, that's what the whole thing is going to evaluate to. I like to think of it. Mm -hmm. You said short circuit. That makes me think of Boolean expressions, where if you and a bunch of things together, as soon as you get a false, it doesn't matter what all the other stuff is. It's going to be false. So there's no sense to evaluate mm -hmm. it. That's how I think about this one. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's good. And, you know, I think, you know, when, when we were thinking about what we wanted to talk about today in the podcast, this one, this article stuck out to me because, you know, I'm, you know, as I'm starting a new role, we have a greenfield project we're doing and we're going to be doing some some listening for some events and so 
you know, I'm going to expect my service to continually look for something new. And if there's nothing, it can just wait and try again. And so, you know, I, I'm not sure yet if there's going to be something that may need to be short circuited or, um, you know, evaluate or, uh, kind of reconnect to something more or less, mm -hmm. um, as this example is showing, but you know, it kind of gave me that refresher on you know, what forever was doing and, and how it worked. And, um, you know, gave me some some tips and tricks as I'm you know, bringing, introducing this function as well as probably explaining and working with the team on this function. And so, you know, that was kind of a, a side note, but that's one of the reasons that I was motivated to kind of talk about this today a little bit. Um, but yeah, so we talked about how applicative or how um, the forever function works with maybes or really the asterisk greater than sign that's from applicative. Talked about that, but uh, he doesn't, or Drew doesn't just kind of stop there. He says, well, you know, there's something, you know, my, our experience at IT Pro as well was, you know, using this other thing called maybe T. Mm -hmm. So the trans, the maybe T, uh, maybe transformer monad, right? So yep, that's transfer. Yeah, normally uh, if there's a T at the end of a type name, that suggests that it is a monad transformer. Right. And so, you know, he kind of goes into this to kind of give you the, um, help you be in the monadic state um, for this uh, evaluation. Yeah. And like him, I don't think we need to go into a full explanation of what monad transformers are. That's a little bit out of scope here. But right. the quick and dirty explanation is that the monad transformer lets you add another capability to your monad stack or whatever context you're operating in. So with maybe T, that means in addition to whatever you're doing, whatever else you're doing, you can express optionality, something that either will be there or won't be there. And for maybe T, it does that behavior we were talking about earlier, where as soon as you get a nothing, it will stop. And that sounds really appealing because that's what we want to do here inside this loop. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so, you know, kind of as he, you know, explains that a little bit without going into too much detail, uh, you know, he just kind of said, you know, here's some examples of using maybe T, you know, contrived, simple to understand um, things. And I'm not going to read them out loud because reading code in, on a podcast just doesn't sound like fun, yeah. but you know, the long and short of it is with maybe T there's a way to short circuit a forever loop. Yeah. And, and it's a handy little function that is actually polymorphic, but in this case, M zero will break you out of whatever loop if you're in a loop or break you out of your maybe T transformer or stop your maybe uh, do block or whatever it is. And the name isn't super evocative in the same way that forever is as a function name. So you may want to, if this is something you do frequently in your code base, you may want to provide an alias for it and call it exit or break or get me the heck out of here or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> or just don't, you know, I don't. know we have like <laughs> you know, do notation and then there's don't notation. Yeah. You know, those are, those are fun things to, uh, to work together. But M0 does exactly what we were discussing earlier of if you're in maybe T, and in this instance, it's IO, so maybe T IO, M0 will work like break and short circuit and stop and not do any of the other stuff. So if you're inside forever and you do a bunch of things and then one of your branches says M0, when it hits that branch, it's going to break out of that loop, which is exactly the behavior he was looking for here. Yeah, I just, I just see it like... You know, every time this happens, it just like busts out into like some high school musical song, like, <laughs> breaking free or something like that. You yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that that really almost, honestly wraps up the blog post. I did want to kind of uh, reach and, and kind of talk more about maybe some of the other looping um, options that are out there. You know, I know at IT Pro we've used a few. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was just kind of curious maybe what some of the pros and benefits were to that. Sure. Keep it short and simple because, you know, we don't want to keep these people in an infinite loop forever. <laughs> so I think the maybe T approach is a good one. 
And in this blog post, Drew links to another blog post by Gabriela Gonzalez. And in that post, uh, it talks about maybe T, but it also talks about either T, which is the monad transformer for either's. And that can do the same thing will it, where it will short circuit and stop as soon as it hits a left instead of a nothing. And that can be useful if you have a program that normally loops and when it stops looping, you need to know why it stopped or you wanna communicate something like that. So imagine that there was like a disconnect message that you may hear that's expected, but then maybe there's also like a disconnect with some extra metadata or maybe like a crash or something like that. And mm -hmm. you want to communicate back the manner in which you stopped looping. That's when you might need something like either T. Gotcha, okay. But Be fundamentally, Fundamentally, the two approaches are the same, where it takes advantage of this short-circuiting behavior to stop in certain circumstances. Um, and in terms of other approaches, I wanted to loop back to the first one we talked about, which is manually recursing by pulling out a function definition and calling yourself so that you do that uh, loop yourself, and then in some branches not doing that. That's often the one that I reach for when I end up in this situation, and I can recognize that it's not very... Um, it's not a very good approach. It's not like not fancy enough. Yeah, not fancy. It's not nice, but it works and you don't really have to think about it. And it makes tracing execution a lot clearer and you don't have to pull in monad transformers and pot potentially explain them. And I feel like this circumstance doesn't actually come up that often in the code that I write, at least, where I have some infinite loop that I sometimes need to break out of. Usually when I have an infinite loop, it's actually infinite or, um, you know, the one or two places in my entire application where I need to do this type of looping, it's fine to m write that recursion manually. I don't even know what to add to that, but yes, <laughs> well said, Taylor. That's, that's really you. what I got to say there. Um, and uh, then I wanted to mention for IO and for many other monads, I think there is another approach, which is to use exceptions. And this is maybe a little less satisfying than the maybe T or either T approach, but what you can do is have your forever loop and then wrap that in something that catches a like early termination exception, which is some data type that you can write. And then in the branches where you want to end early, where you would call M0 or where you would not call that recursive function, instead you can say throw early termination exception and that will break out of the forever loop and be caught by that exception handler. And then that exception handler probably will just do nothing with that. And then it'll continue you know, with whatever else is going on. So uh, I think practically the end result is the same as maybe T or either T, but it gets to use machinery that you probably are more used to from other contexts of throwing and catching exceptions. Yeah, and it, I feel like it could, too, give you more information if you right. had, you know, like, hey, this failed. We're terminating this because of X, Y, or Z. Yeah, that's like the so. either T, because either T can communicate the exact same amount of information. It's just in a little bit different way. And I think if you're already in I.O. or something that can throw exceptions, you might want to go the exception route. But if you're in a pure monad, something that can't throw exceptions or you don't want to for whatever reason, then maybe T or either T are good ones. And I'm sure there are more approaches to this problem, but those are the ones that I'm aware of and those are the ones that I would reach for in this circumstance. Awesome. Well, yeah. And I think that really does it for the, the podcast this week. It's, short and uh, sweet. A little short, short and sweet. It's kind of a probably a breath of fresh air for most people. We've had <laughs> rather long, lengthy conversations the last uh, three or four episodes. So, yeah, let you guys get back to your day. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. Um, I've been one of your hosts, Cameron Guerra. And uh, if you have more interest in maybe what's out there for Haskell Weekly, you can follow us at, uh, on Twitter and any other social platform, maybe. Just call Taylor, really. That's all you got to do. Google him. Calls, you'll please. find him. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Haskell, uh, on Twitter, we're at Haskell Weekly. Or you can visit us on the website at HaskellWeekly.news. 
and that's where you can find all the up-to-date information on Haskell and what's going on in the community. So please check it out. This week, as every week, we are brought to you, sadly, not by our employer anymore, but by my employer, IT Pro TV, an ACI learning company. And they would love to extend to you an offer for 30% off the lifetime of your subscription. Just head over to itpro.tv and type in uh, promo code HaskellWeekly30 to get 30% off the lifetime of your subscription. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> And uh, Cam, I didn't get to say it at the top, but congratulations on your new gig at Moto Refi. Super exciting. And I'm looking forward to our future conversations about how we use Haskell here versus how you use Haskell there. I think it's some good stuff in the, in our future. Oh yeah. Let the debates begin. Exactly. But for I'll now- i roasted by Taylor every time. <laughs> but not yeah, so sure about now. that. For now, that'll do it. And uh, we'll see you next week. Peace.